Excellent, Bob. All right, we need to get started. So, Teresa, if we could go live. Are we live? Uh, good morning, everybody. This is the uh, Friday 8.30 morning uh, Appropriations Committee meeting. Um, we're going to start right now with Sarah Clark, who, was, who is going to provide an overview of uh, CRF funding and uh, what that looks like within the Agency of Human Services. We have a hard stop at 9.15. At 9.15, Adam is going to address the committee for, I should say the Commissioner of Finance and Management will address the committee for 15 minutes regarding the language at the end of the BAA. At 9.30, we have Larry Cooperly to do the special education bill with the dates. And at uh, 9.50, Steve Klein is coming on for 10 minutes to uh, sew up a couple of areas that we needed from JFO. So uh, I am going to make these hard stops because we're on the House floor at 10 o'clock. And um, Sarah, welcome. It's always good to see you. And um, we look forward to your presentation. And what I want to tell committee members, I'd like Sarah to get all the way through her committee, uh, her presentation. And as your hands go up, I'll write names down and then we'll take questions up until 9.15. Um, I'm just sorry, we were just on such a time crunch today. So let's get started. Good morning, Sarah. Okay. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So I'm prepared today to talk to you a little bit about all of the variety of sources of federal funds that are coming to the Agency of Human Services to support us in the response to the COVID pandemic. As you are aware, there are multiple federal fund sources. Um, that have been made available to states throughout essentially four relief bills at the federal level. AHS has been working closely with finance and management on understanding those fund sources and what's available to us, but also establishing a funding hierarchy for how we want to spend those funds. You need to understand what you want to spend first strategically to ensure that you're able to leverage federal funds to the maximum ability. So this has continued to evolve, actually, as we've learned more and more about the federal funds that are available to us, most notably, as you're aware, the $1.25 billion in the Coronavirus Relief Fund. It's really only within the last two weeks that the U.S. Treasury has issued guidance about the uses of those funds. So as we think of the hierarchy of funding for human services, as it stands today, our current plan is to first spend the AHS specific formula or block grants that are 100% federal dollars. We are looking to those first to cover our known incurred expenses. The second tranche is the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Again, those would also be 100% federal dollars. And as you are aware, the Joint Fiscal Committee has set up a process by which we access and spend those funds. I think it's important to understand that as we learn more and move through this crisis, this funding hierarchy may change. But as of today, this is kind of the, the manner in which we are spending funds. The next tier down is FEMA um, for to the extent that the Agency of Human Services has FEMA, FEMA allowable activities, we would be looking to leverage FEMA dollars. Those are $75, $25. So the challenge there is coming up with a 25% match. And so, um, you know, we may want to contemplate using coronavirus relief funds that are 100% federal dollars as opposed to the FEMA dollar because of the challenges of the, of the state match. And then kind of our last tier is Medicaid. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later. As you know, we talked about earlier this week, we did receive a 6.2% bump to our FMAP, but we're still, um, these are the most expensive of the dollars from a state perspective. Um, we're leveraging now with the FMAP bump about 60% from the federal government. That still leaves about a 40% share for the state to cover. And so that's the funding hierarchy as my team and I kind of navigate the expense that we're incurring and determining what's the most uh, appropriate fund source, this is the hierarchy that we keep in mind. So the next part of my presentation, I want to talk about um, the AHS specific grants. So these are those 100% either block grant or formula grants that come to the Agency of Human Services. This aligns to 
Finance and Management did put out a COVID funding tracker. And so it's not organized in the same manner, uh, but it aligns with the information that's presented in that COVID tracker, which is a spreadsheet that tells you kind of by source how much has been issued to the state of Vermont. So let me just, I'll kind of quickly go through the various sources of funding. So from the CDC, we've received a couple of tranches of the public health emergency response grants. The original was awarded in the COVID-1 bill. That was $4.9 million. These are funds that the Department of Health is using in their response to the COVID crisis. And so it's paying for all of their staff time, the lab tests, all of the functions that VDH is doing. Um, I should have probably updated this for, for today, but to, when we last looked at it, we had drawn down of that original $4.9 million, we had drawn down $2.6 million. Um, we've received a second uh, tranche of funding from this source of $5.4 million. It was awarded in the COVID-3 bill. There is a potential for a third of not yet received any award documents from the federal government, but we do understand from some sources that Vermont it is expected to receive an additional um, tier of funding from the Public Health Emergency Response Grant. But since we don't have the award yet, I wanted to make you aware of that possibility, but I don't have any dollars there yet. We are, the health department is kind of following up with their chain and the federal government to try to understand how much and when could possibly be coming to Vermont. So based on the current spending trends, the Department of Health anticipates spending by June 30th, $17 million in their activities in response to the COVID crisis. We've got between the first two tiers, we've got uh, $10 million of funding from the Emergency Health Preparedness Response Grant which will leave us about uh, $7 million short roughly. And so our current strategy, and it was included in the materials that was sent to the Joint Fiscal Committee is that we would be looking to leverage coronavirus relief funds. To cover Sarah, uh, Sarah, I need to have somebody uh, mute their, their um, I hear a lot of noise in the background. Okay, I think we're muted. That was me, sorry. No. Oh, sorry, Marty. Okay, let's continue, Sarah. <laughs> Well, okay. that's you, Marty. That's somebody else. So, uh, if you let let everybody, let's mute everybody, Teresa, please, except Sarah. <laughs> I'm checking for the culprit. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Okay, so that's the um, public health emergency response grant. The next uh, funding I'm going to talk to you about is the congregate and home delivered meals. There were uh, there was 1.2 million dollars uh, awarded in the COVID one bill that has been processed uh, via excess receipts request at Dale. In addition, there was another $2.4 million awarded via the COVID-3 bill that has a portion of that has been processed via excess receipts at Dale. So you should have seen that in some of those excess receipts reports that have been admit, um, provided to you by finance and management. And so those funds are being deployed now. In addition, underneath the family caregiver program, there is a half a million dollars that was awarded to Dale and a $100,000 excess receipt request has been um, approved and those functions are being carried out by Dale now. Similarly, in the Dale realm, there is a supportive services program. There's a million dollars that's been awarded to Dale um, and we are in the process of spending those dollars. <clears throat> Moving on, we talked a little bit about this on Monday because this was in the budget adjustment that was submitted. There is $4.4 million in child care and development block grant that was uh, awarded in the COVID-3 bill. These funds are being used to offset the costs of the stabilizing the child care program that was uh, stood up in March by Governor Scott. And so you, we talked about those funds, I think it was Tuesday or Monday, I don't remember the day that I was in earlier this week, but those funds are in the budget adjustment bill. In addition, DCF received from the community services block grant, $5.1 million that was awarded in the COVID-3 bill. 
for the funding formula associated with that block grant, 90% of those dollars will go out to the CAP agencies to help provide social services and emergency assistance to Vermonters. DCF through the LIHE program was awarded $4.1 million uh, in the COVID-3 bill. These funds are going to be used to extend the crisis fuel season purchase wood and provide funding for unpaid utility bills in response to the COVID pandemic. The Emergency Solutions Grant ESG funds, those were also included in the budget adjustment that we discussed on Tuesday. There was an initial award in the COVID-3 bill of 4.6 million, but HUD um, in the end decided to only release half of those funds to states. And so Vermont has an award of $2.3 million. And that is what you saw in the budget adjustment that we reviewed. It's unknown if HUD will be distributing those funds in the future. We understand that they likely will, but we don't know if it'll be in a different manner or if those funds will come to Vermont similar to how the 2.3 million came to Vermont. Vermont's using these funds to cover housing costs. Um, and additional funds to support the homeless community and shelter programs. In addition, within the HHS rubric, there was additional funding release for small rural hospital improvement program. About $759,000 was awarded to BDH. These funds will be granted out to small rural hospitals. So that essentially, those are at a high level, all of the kind of 100% federal dollars that have flowed to the Agency of Human Services in response to the COVID crisis. The next, and we, we talked about this uh, when I was in for budget adjustment, so I can be brief, but as you know, we received a 6.2% bump in our FMAP in the COVID-2 bill. This has an estimated impact of $38 million based on our estimates from the January um, to June 2020 quarters. So as you know, we've booked those savings in the budget adjustment to help with the overall resolution of the general fund revenue situation in fiscal year 20. The next level that I wanna talk about is as part of the multiple relief efforts at the federal level, there's been significant dollars that have flowed directly to providers. There's a couple of those that I want to discuss with you today. Within the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, there have been two levels of awards, one in the COVID-1 bill and the second in the COVID-3 bill. We were, uh, health centers, which is essentially FQHCs, received 683000 dollars in the COVID-1 bill, and then an additional $8.7 million in the COVID-3 bill. If you're interested, I do have that allocation um, by healthcare center that I could provide to you. Um, so you can see how much flowed directly uh, to those centers. The next tranche uh, is a significant one. Within the CARES Act, so that was the third relief bill, they established Health and Human Services, a provider relief fund. This had $100 billion appropriated to this fund to provide relief to hospitals and other healthcare providers to support healthcare related expenses or lost revenue attributable to the COVID-19 crisis. In addition, providers have been instructed to use these funds to ensure that the uninsured, uninsured Americans get testing and treatment for COVID-19. So again, these are funds that flow directly from the federal government to the providers, does not pass through the state of Vermont. Those, that $100 billion has been released in a few tranches. $30 billion was distributed direct to providers by HHS on Friday, April 10th. That initial $30 billion distribution was based on Medicare fee for service reimbursements in 2019. Vermont received, Vermont providers received $54.5 million. Those funds were distributed to 1,011 Vermont providers. These funds do not need to be repaid. Just um, this week, 
a lot of questions that we get surrounding this 100 billion is how much are providers getting? Just this week, um, and I can share the link with you, the federal government has started publishing the distribution of these funds by state and by provider and the amounts that they were received. So shortly after the first 30 billion was released, the 20 billion was released by HHS the week of April 23rd. The idea was it was to augment the initial allocation of 30 billion, not million, I wrote 30 million there, it's 30 billion. <laughs> so that the whole $50 billion would be distributed proportionally to the provider's share of their 2018 net patient revenue. In addition to that 50 billion, um, HHS has distributed 12 billion to facilities that it have uh, large numbers of COVID-19 patients. Vermont did not receive any uh, of those funds from the $12 billion allocation. However, there is another tranche of $10 billion that was directed to providers in rural areas. Vermont has received $74.6 million of those funds to 80 providers. There is an additional allocation under development for HHS to distribute more of this $100 billion that'll be based more on Medicaid providers. The concern being with the initial release, releases of funding, it was based on Medicare. And so they're trying to address um, providers that be, may be, have a higher percentage of Medicaid or may be <laughs> Medicaid. And so uh, we expect to receive those funds likely within the next couple of weeks. Say hello. Hello, Sarah. I'm yeah. sorry, I just got booted off I just got booted off for the last three minutes. I lost my power, so I'm 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 on my cell phone. Um, so yeah. I don't want to interrupt, but, but I don't know where we are in the process right now. Sure, I think I, I just wrapped up. Representative Toll walking folks through the CARES Act Provider Relief Fund. That was the hundred billion dollars that was directly appropriated to HHS to provide relief to hospitals and other healthcare providers. And so essentially those funds have been released in a couple of different tranches. Um, there's still some funds remaining to be distributed, but I walked uh, the committee through what those tranches are. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And the last section that I wanted to talk about is in addition to the kind of formula funding, the Medicaid FMAP, the funds direct to providers, there are also opportunities for states and agencies of human services to provide to apply directly for federal funding. So as we talked about a little bit on my testimony and budget adjustment and was approved by the Joint Fiscal Committee, I think probably about two weeks ago, the agency through DMH and VDH were successful um, in applying for and being awarded a Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA grant for emergency grants to address mental and substance use disorders during the COVID-19 crisis. So the state of Vermont essentially received a $2 million award. In addition, the Department of Corrections is working with the Department of Public Safety to apply for a Department of Justice, Office of Justice Programs grant that would provide some funding to help, um, help corrections in their response to the COVID crisis. So we're anticipating that these funds could be used to cover some overtime, any equipment, supplies, those types of things. That grant um, hasn't been submitted yet to the federal government. I don't believe it has a deadline until maybe mid to end May. And so not clear yet whether we will receive those funds or not, but I wanted you to be aware of uh, some of the things that we are uh, contemplating right now. But that was pretty quick, 8.52. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to stop stopping. Representative Toll, you need to turn off the other, you can't have two meetings at once or you get the echo. So if you have your phone still going, you'll need to disconnect that one. Okay, I'm back. I had to have my daughter disconnect me. I, I apologize. So now let's open this up to questions. And Sarah, I might have to have a phone call later to catch up on a couple of things I missed. I, I can't raise my hand. 
Oh, Bob, let me see. <laughs> um, Bob, do you have a question for Sarah? Uh, I do. I just want to okay. tell you, though, you can't raise your hand. So anyways, yes, I do, Sarah. So, and this is something you probably won't want to answer, and, and I doubt if you even can. But so, and, and don't get me wrong, I appreciate the federal government and their involvement in this. Without them, we'd really be sunk. But if I'm not mistaken, they borrowed $2 trillion to begin with. And now we hear this word, the word extended out, and da di da di da, with no dollar amounts put on that. So, when we get done, we are going to have borrowed in excess of $2 trillion on top of what I think was to begin with $16 trillion from other stuff. Is there ever a point in time when the federal government gets into the same boat we are? <laughs> I mean, how much of this can they withstand? I mean, because they're being affected the same as we are. I'm not sure if this is a question for Sarah or not, if she can. Well, who would I ask? The janitor? I don't know who to ask. I think that you would ask Patrick Leahy or uh, Bernie Sanders. Patrick Leahy. Or... Well, no, okay, no, I'm yeah. serious. No, I'll no, no, I'm, I'm serious. I really think that it has to go to the federal level. But Sarah, did you have a response? I, I do not have a response. Um, Thank I, you. I'm sorry, Bob. I'm just going to. Uh, Dave Wait till Peter, it happens, I guess. <laughs> Dave, Peter, okay. Chip, and Mary. We'll send you the link and the information, Bob, because it's an important thank, question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah, um, in the hundred, uh, in the funds that came to Vermont that you said that were distributed based on fee for service, was Vermont um, disadvantaged because we have a different payment methodology in part? And do you know if our congressional delegation is trying to remedy that in any way? And was it significant? Representative Yacovoni, that's a, an excellent point. In the initial release of the 100 billion, the $30 billion that went out on April 10th, Vermont uh, was disadvantaged because of our uh, all payer model construct. However, working with the delegation and with our partners at CMS, I understand that that um, kind of shortfall in funding in the original $30 billion tranche should have been rectified with the $20 billion that was released subsequent to that. Saying that, uh, I would want to confirm probably with the director of healthcare reform, reform Ina Backus, to make sure that oh, Nolan's raising his hand, um, whether we've truly kind of made up for the shortfall in the original tranche. Thank you. So people are focused on it. We'll learn more. But, Nolan, but, did you, you want to weigh in on it? Yeah, I, the, the second tranche, the 20 billion, we got 16 million. And my understanding was that was to sort of kind of offset or reallocate. That's, that was my understanding from Sanders, Sanders' office. And then just if I may, one other question, and then I'll jump off, Kitty, if I may, quickly. Yes. Um, yes. Though I have several, but um, under the supported services money for Dale, the $1 million, do you, do you have any details on that in terms of what that means and whom it may be intended for? Dave, if I can get back to you or the whole committee via an email, I do have that information. I just don't have your tips right now without taking yep. a few minutes and, and so I can follow up. And here's what's behind my question, though it's not apparent at all. Um, we, I've heard from several providers saying, oh my gosh, I hope you'll, you'll fund some uh, essential services uh, wage uh, supplements for the essential workers who are lower paid. So I questioned, I said, well, if there's these other federal dollars and not knowing the end, the order of magnitude that might be needed, couldn't those dollars be determined by AHS and the respective departments to provide uh, wage relief in the absence of a larger bill that's far more complex about who should be in or who should not be in. So that's that's what I'm curious. Okay, that's um, helpful we, context. Yeah, I know we lost an adult daycare provider in Washington County recently. I just I'm I'm worried about the uh, what we don't know about what's happening with the social. Uh, safety net. Thank you. I'll jump off so others can speak. Thank you, Kitty. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Peter, Chip, and Mary. 
Sarah, I want to thank you for, for this sheet. This is extraordinarily helpful. Um, really lays it out very, very well. Um, Dave asked my, uh, my first question. My only other question is regarding the FEMA piece. Do you have a similar sheet that shows you know, what is being applied for through FEMA to backfill funds that are being expended either in the state emergency operations center operations or, or whatever? And if you would, please, I've, I've actually worked in the state EOC many times. I understand the concept. If you could just briefly explain to everyone the, all the different piece parts in the state EOC, or at least some of them. I talked I talk someone through the, the fact there's a logistics section in there, so they handle the PPE and things like that. But if just if, explain to folks what they do in there, please. Sure, and actually, you might be better suited to, to do that, Representative Fagan, but let me talk a little bit how I think with this disaster, it's truly unlike any we've experienced before. And so I think for the Agency of Human Services and the SEOC, um, something has arisen that perhaps didn't exist in the SEOC before. And that is, we have stood up a human services branch of the SEOC because a lot of the crisis response is focused on human services areas. We've actually more rig rigorously staffed the SEOC than we historically would have, let's say, for a flood response, for example. And so there is, Jenny Samuelson has been tasked as the lead of the SEOC branch, working with Jason Goslin, who is in the secretary's office, our kind of emergency response coordinator, that's his full-time job. In addition, Jill Gould, who some of you remember through her tenure in state government, she works for me now, she has been tasked as the kind of financial lead of the SEOC human services branch. And so that team and then Jill to me directly is how I kind of get my communication out of the SEOC as we as we go through various iterations of what response is needed uh, so that we can track any sort of potential FEMA eligible costs. Is there anything that you would like to add about the SEOC structure? It's it's basically an enormous coordination and, and then um, developing decisions and then uh, in instituting action branch of, of federal government in situations where there's an emergency going on. Um, they have many different portals in there from, from just one for transportation only to, to engineering type assets if necessary, certainly logistics in this case. Um, you talked about the Agency of Human Services. Um, just It's been a while, but just there's, there must be 15 or 20 different desks in there, each with a different function. So would you do us a favor, though, and get us that, that the, the FEMA piece to this? This, I can't tell you how, you know, this lays it out, and it really is helpful. So thank you. Yeah. Thank um, you, Peter. Um, we have Chip, Mary, and Diane. Um, thank you. So Sarah, um, Dave asked my first question too. So I guess at some point I would be interested in um, a follow-up from Diva or someone about just whether or not the amount that Nolan mentioned seems to be the right amount to um, take into account the fact that we have a different payment system for a somewhat significant number of patients. Um, but my other two questions are um, the small hospital improvement program, small rural hospital improvement program um, what, what's that money particularly for and how is it allocated? Um, so that those funds represented an increase to an existing program that the Department of Health administers. I can follow up with you with more specific details in terms of how those dollars were actually allocated. Okay. Um, it, yeah. All right. Um, but that, but those, those are additional federal dollars that are a result that, that came in response to a COVID, COVID response, right? Correct. Yep, all of the dollars on this on this sheet were allocated as a re result of response to the COVID crisis. Okay, um, yeah, just a, doesn't have to be detailed, but just some general understanding of that would be helpful. And then lastly, um, uh, the letter E down here, 2E, um, the providers, um, money to providers in rural areas. Um, so initially, early on, there were a number of providers, individual, particularly private, um, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, primary care providers who were um, really in, in dire straits. Is that what this money is um, 
intended to go to? Uh, and again, sort of the same question, how, how is this money, what's it to be used for and how was it allocated? So my understanding is that it, it was allocated for the purposes that you just mentioned. It is something that HHS allocated, I believe based on the Medicare fee for service. Um, I don't have yet available because the federal government hasn't provided that yet in terms of provider by provider for that particular tranche of funding. I'll share with Teresa so the committee has it. I believe it's just yesterday or the day before where they, the federal government has made available more details in terms of this $100 billion and how it's been distributed by provider. Uh, okay, I mean, my, my interest is not quite that down at the level of who got it, but more what, what, was, what was it eligible, who was eligible to get it um, and how, you know, how it was determined, how it was allocated. Um, and I guess just, yeah, that's it. So yeah, well, if we could get that at some point, that'd be great. Yeah, and again, when I can, I will. It's just not something that came through the state. Fine, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chip. Um, Mary and Diane and Kimberly. Hi, I, I too was struggling with devices, so missed part of what you were saying, Sarah, and I'll listen to the link and try to catch up. Do you, I, I have two questions. With regard to the Department of Justice grants, um, do you know if there's a limitation on what the state can receive there? The reason I'm asking the question, I see that DOC is applying for this grant, which is fabulous, but I'm wondering about also the um, judiciary taking advantage of that. And I know that's not your your obligation, but I'm just wondering if there's a limit to how much we can apply for there. Yeah, so I should say Department of Public Safety is the lead on this grant. I think the okay. intent of the grant is that it's specific to states, departments of public safety and departments oh, of corrections. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then you um, referenced um, an earlier, some money that was being used for emergency housing for folks without homes that, uh, and I've lost wherever it is on the page. It, it was some money, but surely you need a huge amount more than that. Do you have, can you tell us what the needs, what you have spent there and what you anticipate needing and what your thoughts are on fig figuring that out, filling that? Yes, so um, that's the emergency solutions grants, which was number eight underneath the AHS mm -hmm. specific grants. You are correct. The need is much greater than what you are seeing um, reflected here. Again, this ties into the AA1 for the Coronavirus Relief Fund, because there you're going to see more of the need reflected in mm -hmm. how the administration is proposing to use those funds and the kind of first emergency response to um, the COVID crisis. I do think that the housing conversation is one that is going to be going on um, in partnership with the administration and the legislature over the next months and years in terms of what response is needed. I would encourage you, and I think you had Commissioner Schatz in, I know you had Commissioner Schatz in, I'm not sure how much you talked about the housing components mm -hmm. related to that, but I do think that he and his team, Sean Brown, Sarah Phillips would be better suited to give you a more full fleshed housing picture. But I can tell you there are costs in the AA1 for the CRF um, that will need to be funded because for example, as you are aware, our general assistance motel program has essentially the, the, the increase in need there has been significant in response to the crisis. Are, are you, do you have a, are you running a spreadsheet on just the housing, you know, the emergency assistance housing related costs? And could we, I'm just trying to understand the magnitude of the problem. Yeah, so I think, um, yes, we do have that information. 
and it is included in the AA1 information okay, that went to the Joint there. Fiscal Committee, but we can get at a greater level of detail. I think as we kind of move forward with how we're using the coronavirus relief fund, you're gonna wanna have myself and others perhaps back yeah. in to talk in more detail on, on the proposed use of those funds. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Yep. Okay, we have uh, Diane and Kimberly and we have seven minutes and Peter, we'll get to your question if we have time before 9.15, Diane? Thank you, Sarah. Well, well, luckily, you know, Dave and, and Chip actually had answered some of the questions I had written down here or asked them anyway. But my I'll, the follow up will be on um, very much where the federal funds direct uh, where Chip was on letter E uh, under the two, the 74.6 million distributed to 80 providers and um, in rural areas. I was just, can you give me an idea of what you mean by providers? Is it just hospitals? Or is it something like uh, a designated agency? Are they considered a provider that provide um, Medicaid? So yeah. I don't believe it includes designated agencies, but it's broader than just hospitals. Let me get back to you with okay. the federal guidance yeah. that has been issued in terms of who they sent those funds to, like the, the kind of general yeah, like information about provider. types of providers. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, who is a provider, who received, you know, and who didn't receive it as a part of that. So and this is my other bigger, and I think this goes to what Mary's, you know, this looks really nice. There's a lot of money on these two pages and it's all welcome news to us, but I, I, but I don't see on here, and I don't know if you've got a handle, we don't have it yet, is, um, you know, do we have any idea of how well this dollars are gonna support and fulfill the needs that are out there? So we might have 10 million, but is it, 30 million worth of the need, or is it 7 million and we're really in good shape? That's what I don't get a sense for is how well we, how well the federal support is hitting the full target. Yeah, I think that's why, uh, you know, the coronavirus relief fund and as we move forward together and appropriating those dollars, that's really going to be the key piece because I would say for the most part, the the funds that we've talked about today don't meet the need 100%. And so that's where that 1.25 right. billion is gonna be critical to Vermont and all states. And then, then I'll finish with, and then how are we, the big we, how are we going about finding out what the need is out there to help to make sure that we don't over support some area, which I don't think we have at risk of yeah. at this point, and then totally under support other places. That would yeah, be the so, big question. Yeah, and I think again, like as we've talked about before, the Agency of Human Services has stood up a variety of processes to respond to the immediate cash needs of some of our critical healthcare providers and beyond. So those efforts are ongoing and again is linked to the okay. Coronavirus Relief Fund. But I think this is an area where you're gonna want us to come in and talk to you about what we've done, yeah. who we've helped. Um, and why. It's a conversation about potentially is there, are there other organizations that may need assistance in the future? Because it's not like we're gonna get out of the end of May and things are going to be right on target. Right. <laughs> so I just, this is just AHS. So there's many other areas. Many so this is right. one little spot. All right, I'm gonna end with that. Sorry, Kitty, go. Nope, you're fine, thank you. Uh, Kimberly? Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, Sarah, my question was very much an echo of what's been said already and I was, focused on uh, under AHS specific grants on number six, particularly the CAP agencies, getting to Diane's point about some sort of coordination mechanism. But listening to you, it also made me ponder whether you are, you being AHS is going about this in terms of all monies being put out the door as quickly as possible now, or is there some thinking of holding back throughout the summer or fall because we don't know what comes next? Yeah, that's actually a great question and strategically thinking about how we release funds and what type of funds we release. And so, you know, I would say for the funds that AHS specific grants that you see on this sheet in large part, our focus on is on getting those dollars out the door first. And then as we move through time, leveraging the coronavirus relief fund, working with the executive branch and the legislature about what's the most appropriate use of those funds to shore up the healthcare system and our all of our provider networks. And then outside of AHS, there's I'm sure plenty of need. 
Right, because that gets us into the whole concept of the tension between short and long-term investments. Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, we do have two minutes left. So Peter, we are back to you and Mary, your hand is up. Did you have a follow-up? Thank so, you, Sarah. So questions? very brief. Obviously we cannot use coronavirus relief funds, the 1.25 billion to replace Vermont revenue. I lost revenue for the state of Vermont. But what about hospitals? I'm concerned about hospitals. I'm concerned about providers. What about hospitals and providers that have realigned their services, stopped providing their services that for them made money, but their expenses continued because they continued to pay people. Um, that's lost revenue to those providers. Mm -hmm. is, this, is this the same definition for them as us? Can we use coronavirus relief funds to make those folks whole? Yes, um, I'm just noticing Nolan put a chat comment yeah, in. I've never seen that function, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, Representative Fagan, so our expectation in some of the processes that we've stood up to shore up the healthcare system, including hospitals and all other healthcare providers, is that we would anticipate using the coronavirus relief funds as part of those stabilization efforts. Um, I, 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 I don't have like at the top of my mind, the kind of specific guidance from the coronavirus relief fund where we're saying, yes, this is why we can move forward in this manner, but that is our expectation. And okay. as, you, as you know, I think the committee is aware we have provided some relief direct to, to hospitals uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a situation that we're actively monitoring. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Nolan did put up in our chat, if you see hospitals also received 159 million advance um, Medicaid payments to help with cash flows. And I think I understand Dave's question, advance, does that mean have to be repaid? I think that means you receive less yes. coming in later. Is that correct, Nolan? That's my understanding. Yeah. It creates help now, but a tough situation later. Sarah, again, with everything like this, uh, the more information we receive, the more questions that we're going to have. And, and you, you uh, pointed out several areas where when you come back, you can expand yep. um, on, on information that we need to have. But we're going to move right to Adam. Sarah, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Commissioner, um, uh, Commissioner, we wanted to focus in on the language at the end of BAA, and we have 15 minutes to do this because we're on a tight schedule because we have to be on the floor at 10 for action, and we hear a bill voted out and hear from Joint Fiscal. So if, if we could, okay. nice to see you, and if we could move right to that language, um, it's up on our screen. If you would like to talk about um, the change made and, and why uh, the administration that's necessary. Right. First of all, can everyone, I, can you hear me, Madam Chair? Yes, I can. Okay. So we um, put that language in the uh, budget adjustment because at the time, and I believe currently, um, we were looking to give ourselves more flexibility coming into closeout. So a couple of points I'd make. First, uh, this is for the next seven weeks. And it, as you'll note, the last line there, this broadened authority would end effective June 30th, 2020. So we're giving ourselves additional flexibility uh, for closeout, which you know, I, I think you might um, agree could be a bit more chaotic than usual um, with, um, the emergency response to COVID-19. So this is one area that we thought it would probably be advantageous to have more flexibility. Currently, the Commissioner of Finance with the approval of the governor has the flexibility um, to move appropriations within an agency or a department up to $50,000. So for example, within human services, we could move it from, um, you know, within, child development uh, DCF to another component of DCF, perhaps reach up or the like. Uh, so that flexibility exists, but it's for very small amounts. And we thought that in light of the fact that uh, it could be more hectic this year than in other years, uh, we would expand that flexibility. Uh, so the first point I'd make is, you know, this would allow us to um, increase the amount of money that we move for closeout it would also allow us to do it a 
across state government as opposed to within one agency or department. And the reason we did that is again, because we're anticipating a somewhat more hectic closeout and it may be that uh, we need to move money around um, as, we, as the numbers become more clear and the dust settles. I would also note that we are not asking to increase appropriations. So the amount of money that is appropriated in the budget will not grow or frankly shrink. It, it will be the same amount of money. We're just moving within that pot uh, money around. And it will, as I said earlier, uh, expire. This is really just to help us with close out in FY20. So uh, really that's, I think the, the big picture uh, as well as the small picture. There's really not a lot to this. So I'm happy to answer questions. And, and I certainly understand, um, you know, small amounts that, you know, that's why the 50,000 is there. But if there was a large adjustment that needed to be made, wouldn't the governor want to use his authority to convene the e-board? Um, sure. Uh, the, the emergency board um, is an option. And typically, I think if it's um, larger than uh, $50,000, he would go to the e-board under current statute. But, uh, you know, I, I think this allows the flexibility amid the kind of the chaotic closeout. And, you know, closeouts typically have lots of moving parts, but we're anticipating this year it might be a little bit more moving. And so uh, we thought that rather than um, go to the e-board with uh, different requests, we would uh, move it internally within the Commissioner of Finance and the Secretary of Administration's office. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Mary, your hand was up and then down, and then I have Chip. Uh, so is it me then? Mute, Mary, can you unmute? Uh, Commissioner, can you tell us where you're thinking that these needs are going to be? Well, typically, um, we have needs within human services, a very large agency with lots of moving parts. Um, but we're also anticipating potentially within uh, transportation uh, that's currently, um, I wouldn't call it a holding pattern, but they've got projects that they may want to ramp up um, as the governor loosens um, the emergency order and allows people more to get back to work. Um, so we're anticipating there, it could be a little bit more chaotic and also within public safety um, where, you know, the, we, the uh, Department of Public Safety has been kind of a purchasing agent for the State Emergency Operations Center uh, and there's lots of moving parts there. So. You know, I would say those agencies, I, I, those are the first three that come to mind, but there may be others. So that's interesting. I was assuming that we were talking about this in order to close holes that were created in the budget, but in your description of what you might want to do at in transportation, I, I presumed that that meant hey, we may want to, as a stimulus, try to move money to projects that we could get going. Am I reading too much into what you just said? Uh, I think you're reading too much into what I just said. <laughs> okay, so wh the, what is the intention of this? What, wh is it to fill existing holes? within departments? It's no. I mean, again, I, I would emphasize that we're not increasing appropriations. So if, um, say, with um, you know, uh, human services, they have money that um, either unspent money in uh, one particular DCF appropriation uh, that might be uh, available uh, with no harm to DCF, to move into uh, another uh, part, mental health, for example. Um, it would be to allow the movement of existing appropriations around to areas where they weren't originally targeted. That's all. So, I mean, in a sense, yes, it's filling holes, but it, it's not intended to handle um, large increases in appropriations or un unanticipated increases in appropriations. It's really just trying to uh, settle the amounts of money that we have and put them in place so that we can close out whole. And if one area has some excess, 
and another area has some deficit, we can move money within that area. But you can already do that between, I didn't mean to interrupt Mary, between, yeah. between DCF and mental health, but this would allow you to take, maybe if there's extra money in DCF and move it to corrections, or, or no, that's the same, okay. or move it to um, transportation. Well, we can, I mean, we can do that very small amounts. I mean, $50,000, I think, in the context of the several hundred million dollars that we've anticipated spending kind of the emergency, at least at the, you know, $50,000 really is not any substantial amount of money. So, you know, I would argue we really mm -hmm. can already do that. Um, yeah, I don't think you can but, move it from DCF to transportation. No. But that's true. But but this would Maybe allow you, but this bit. language would allow that to happen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mary, I didn't mean to interrupt. Are you finished? What? Um, so would you use this money to replace similar money? Or I mean, so now I'm thinking if you move general fund dollars into transportation, which is typically, you know, it's paid for with transportation funds is, so we're going to start kind of commingling special funds. Well, that, and that's a point well made. I think that was a poor example. Um, I'm, I'm thinking yeah. of this more within fund balances. Um, I mean, I guess in the extreme, we, we could think of that, but uh, you know, I'm really thinking more along the lines of balancing out the general fund. And if there's extra money in one department that we can move over to another department, um, that would be the way I would think about it. I, I really, I, like I said, I think that was a poor example. I wouldn't think of this as much as uh, moving between special funds. I think that would be a little bit more complicated. But it is allowable under this language. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Chip? Um, Kind of following up, I guess, um, I, I appreciate um, the need for this, I think, and to me, it makes sense um, it, to do it, to be able to do it in this um, this particular year. And I'm happy to see that you've got the language in there that limits it to um, the 2020 closeout or the 2020 budget. Um, all that said, I get a little bit of heartburn over um, having, particularly having both the ability to move it kind of anywhere, you know, between agencies as well as between departments and have an unlimited amount of uh, money for which you can do that. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, it, it seems like being able to do that to help with closeout, um, which it will be more chaotic, but I, I think in likelihood is probably the need isn't going to be an un, you know a huge amount. We're not talking millions of dollars. I would expect we're talking a hundred thousand dollars or something. I mean, is it? Could you effectively do what you want to do by limiting the amount of money, still being able to transfer it between agencies or departments, um, and then? But if there is a particularly emergent need, uh, have the governor call the e-board together. I guess that's a long way of saying, is there is it problematic to 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 limit this to a um, something that everybody can be comfortable with in a dollar amount and have the governor call the e-board if it exceeds that amount? Is there a big is that a uh, a hurdle that's difficult to get over uh, in the time constraints you're thinking about? Well, I, I think the context in which we uh, put this together, um, you know, which was, you know, a month ago when we originally come up with this and thought about it, uh, we were, you know, in a, I would say somewhat different um, mindset. And as the dust has started to settle, I would not at, go so far as to say has settled, but as I think it, the picture has become more clear um, it, 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 it maybe it changes the need. Uh, I would not say, however, that it changes the need back to, say, the ability to move fifty thousand dollars around. It just 
that amount I think would be um, kind of constraining in light of the fact that we have um, many moving parts. Um, but to the uh, extent that the committee would be more comfortable with a number, um, I, I would not object to that. I do think that the, the um, secretary would need more um, wiggle room than she currently has. Um, and that I think is the intent here to reference the fact that $50,000 is probably too small and it would be, I think kind of, I don't know, silly to require an e-board meeting to move $100,000 from Department of Children and Families to the Department of Mental Health. So, but, you know, should it be unlimited? Uh, I, I guess I would turn that back on the committee to uh, choose, but the um, more flexibility that the secretary has, I think under the circumstances uh, would be better. So um, just a quick follow up. So do you have a number in mind, like what, what would be a number that makes sense in your view that limited to? And secondly, um, maybe, well, maybe you can help me understand what the, what it takes to call the e-board together, particularly when we're doing uh, all this stuff remotely and people generally are around. I guess I'm, I, I just, I don't know. I've never been to an e-board meeting. I don't know what they take, what it, what is involved. Well, I think um, the e-board can be called either by the governor or by, I think, a quorum of e-board members. Uh, the chair know that uh, better than I. Um, I believe you're correct. But um, the governor typically uh, typically um, right. brings the brings the group together. And in terms of uh, so you know how difficult that would be, uh, I don't know. Um, probably not difficult. Um, although again, I think calling a meeting to move a hundred thousand dollars or even two hundred thousand dollars between one department or another just to allow closeout, I think, might. Um, you know, strain the schedules of the people on the e-board. Um, but to, to answer your first question about what size would be reasonable, um, I, when we originally uh, put this together, we thought a million dollars would be reasonable. And as the crisis kind of deepened, we said, you know what, let's not limit ourselves. Um, I think th this, I think the more flexibility you have to manage in a crisis, the more, the better. But I think our original thought was a million dollars. Thank you, Adam. It is 930. And uh, Kimberly, can your answer, can your question be a 30 second one? So that we yes, okay. yes. My question is, do you prioritize the ability to move within agencies over above the change in or removal of a cap with the amount is one more of greater importance than the other to you? Uh, I think not. I think not. Okay, thank you, Adam. Um, so thank you. we'll come back uh, to this question. Um, I'm trying to see where the time will, will fit to do that. But we need to move now to Representative Cooperly, who I bet was all in the golf course yesterday afternoon on that beautifully sunny day when, um, but I, I, I don't want to assume anything. <laughs> um, are you with us, Larry? There you are, you're smiling. So I bet you were golfing. You're a little more tan than, than I am. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, was not golfing, um, although I haven't been invited to golf today. But uh, I was, you know, outside doing some lawn work under the pressures of my wife, who said, get out there and mow the lawn and do this and do that. So anyway, um, I'm not an undercover legislator. I really am Larry Cooperly, Representative Larry Cooperly. I serve on the, uh, for the record, uh, I serve on House Education. And I've been invited to present before your committee this morning um, S-343, uh, which basically is just a moving a time uh, element. Um, and it relates obviously to special education changes due to the COVID-19 um, state of emergency and it reflects the delays to act 173 uh, which was signed into law in 2018. I can briefly uh, go over that a little bit if there's people in committee who are not familiar 
with Act 173. Well, um, we'll, we'll take the, the, the flyby on that one. Uh, okay, quick. good. Well, it primarily relates to the effectiveness and availability and equity of services provided to students who require special education. Um, I, have a, I have a little chart here that might make this a little easier to understand. And also, uh, yeah, little chart, look at this. But it's um, basically two major components of, of Act 173. One was to reform special education funding um, from a reimbursement model to a census-based model um, with support for school districts. Um, the other is a requirement that approved independent schools to enroll students who are an IEP recommended by um, students, local education agency. Um, and last year in the big bill, the effective date uh, for the change in funding was moved out for one year to fisc uh, fiscal year 22 um, for the 21-22 school year. And the date for the commencement of the associated rulemaking was also delayed. Um, in S343, the delays by a further year to FY23 for the 22-23 school year um, is, is um, an effective date change for funding. Um, and those dates continue to move out, um, as you can see in the chart in front of you, to FY26, FY27. Um, the delays are certainly needed. As you all know, there are no children in school today. I mean, we, we have literally shut our education system down and remote learning has become the mode of education for most of our children today. Um, there are certainly a number of day changes as you can see in the chart in front of you. Um, they're, they're all conforming changes. Um, it, it also, this bill S343 um, contains technical changes recommended by the Agency of Education. Um, they were passed by the House last year in House 521. The bill did die in conference when the Senate tacked Act 46 delay language into it. Um, S43 also will extend um, the census-based funding advisory group, which is advising the Agency of Education on rulemaking by an additional year to June 30th, 2023, an increase with the frequency of their annual meetings. Um, they do receive per diem compensation um, and they go from eight months, the new advisory group to 12 months. And I think that one of the, um, one of the situations is I guess we're looking um, and before your committee, um, because the appropriation does change from $5,036 to $9,018. Um, so I guess the additional 3,600 plus um, would be needed and, um, and approved by the House Appropriation Committee. And that basically is what I have to say. Um, and um, the advisory committee does meet once a month and it, uh, I've attended their meetings, um, very important part of this issue um, being that this is a really big change in how we're gonna fund special education. Um, the average daily membership for each school district or supervisory union will determine the amounts of money that the agency of education will be distributing to uh, these thing, to these uh, districts and supervisory unions. So, any questions from anyone? I think, Kitty, I think you're, uh, there you go. I, I was mute. Thank you, Larry, and thank you for the overview. Uh, members did receive um, the bill yesterday when we were, when we looked at it late in the day, so we had last night to, to read over these changes. Um, do we have questions? I have a question from Chip and a second hand raise that I've got. To... Chip, why don't you start and then Diane? Um, thanks, Larry. Um, so why, um, what was the, 
Well, I appreciate the need for this advisory um, committee uh, and I can sort of, well, maybe I'll ask you um, a couple things. So the advisory committee has been in existence. Um, does this, so this would, in a sense, extend the, the lifetime of the advisory committee. And that would also increase, I think, the, the, the months that they meet. Can you tell me the committee's rationale for, for both of those? Why, um, you know, if it was set up for the advisory committee to exist for a certain amount of time to start with, why would we increase the, the time there um, they exist and why increase the amount of time they're meeting at this point? Well, the, the advisory committee, um, you know, and the, the, this again, Chip, is, a, is an extremely complex um, uh, bill. And uh, the advisory committee that has met, they, they have extended from an eight month, I believe when they started um, last year, there was an eight that they didn't have the full 12 months um, to organize and put together the the uh, information that will be provided by the rule makers who are the uh, State Board of Education. And uh, this advisory committee is made up of, of the uh, NEA superintendents, principal association, certainly the agency of education is uh, the uh, agency of education is well represented. But there, there seems to be, a, particularly with the earlier chart that you saw, there seems to be um, a particular need for more uh, of, of this meeting issue to really find out what census grants are going to be needed, um, what their, you know, I think the other issue is, you know, how do we deal with with perhaps declining population in our schools um, and how these grants uh, will be done for uniform base amounts. Uh, it, there's just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of information that's really gonna be needed um, to supply the uh, State Board of Education and the Agency of Education as well. And we, um, we, did take this up in committee, as you know, and it, it went out of our committee 11-0. Um, then looking, certainly we addressed the, the issue of the appropriation. Um, but these, these meetings do, do entail a couple of hours uh, once a month to um, really put together a good plan that will work um, in, in terms of providing special education for our school children. Thanks. I'm, I'm just trying to get a, I, I'll be reporting this for the, for our committee. And I just want to try to make sure I have an understanding of why your committee is, um, thinks this is uh, a valuable increase in, in, in um, and the other question I have, um, I'll ask you, but it may be um, for our, our chair as well. Um, so this, this would increase the, um, the amount appropriated for these meetings for the in FY 21. Do we need to pass it in in this bill? Is it better uh, in the 21 budget? Um, if we choose to pass this bill, then we would reflect the dollars in our budget. But we we've done this before where we pass a bill uh, separately. Okay. And, uh, it's a COVID related bill that's very specific uh, out of a committee. I, I think that it should continue on its journey. Okay. My opinion. I'd let the committee weigh in on that. We have we do have two other questions, Chip. Are you finished? Yeah, I'm done. I'm done. Thank you. Diane and Mary. Oh, thank you. Mine's probably pretty simple, I hope. So just I just want to make sure that I've got the right bill that that uh, House education passed with no changes to the bill as introduced and passed by the Senate. Is that correct? That's correct. It's, it's the bill is S343. Okay, good. I just want to make sure that I've got the right copy. Thank you. And Mary. When I looked at this quickly last night, I thought, oh, 
we're just adding another $4,000 to the cost. But in fact, we are adding 27 plus thousand dollars to the cost. Um, I, I understand. So that gives me a little bit more pause. Um, I am wondering why we are appropriating money in 22 and 23 effectively. Um, so that's just kind of one area of wondering that I have. Um, and then the more relevant question for you, um, Representative, is we were so excited when the underlying concept was introduced, what, in 18 or 19, um, one, because of the great benefits to kids, but being penny pinching appropriations people, we also thought that we would see some serious cost savings in special education. And my question yeah. is, when are we going to start seeing those savings? And in, in particular, if we're pushing this out, what seems like not just one year, but several years. I, you know, that's, I think that's one of the, I, I, I relate, go back to Chip's question. I think those are the issues that the advisory board are working with um, very, and it's difficult, I understand. The savings basically becomes, in my, in my conversations and reflecting back a couple of years here, um, the savings basically come to children on IEPs, though hopefully, you know, there's gonna be less, less people um, on IEPs as our population continues to drop. But the other, um, relative to the expense or the uh, appropriation for the, for the uh, advisory board, um, the advisory board will not exist after this year, I mean, after this, two th after 2022. Um, there is a sunset on the board and um, the appropriation for $9,018 will in fact give them this one year of meetings. Um, and it is, as you see in the bill um, for the fiscal year 2021. So Larry, what are the costs for 22 and 23? We would, yeah. we would come back and look at those? You, I, it is my opinion that you would come back and look at those. Um, the advisory board is, is, um, is I think that appropriation is part of the 9,000. The appropriation. So, and that may have, I, I may, um, in the, the, the meetings um, that they're gonna have, go from eight meetings, which they had last year, to 12 meetings, is my understanding. Um, and, will continue through 2023. And the appropriation will be, that appropriation may change depending on, depending on um, the fiscal notes that we get in terms of what fuel mileage, et cetera, changes, who knows? I, I don't know, but we know that the 9,018 is appropriated. Uh, if you yes, I, not seen. read page six of on, eight yes. of the bill, and what it does is direct the agency of education to include in its budget nine thousand dollars for those two years. Yeah. Um, you, in, um, in my way of thinking, that's an appropriation. We can deal with it when we get there. Um, we normally don't, well, I don't know about that, but we are directing AOE to keep it, in, to put it in its budget. That's correct. Okay, I, I just need some clarification here. So we are on um, page six, it's a letter G for reimbursements. So it's, don't, don't. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, it's, got it's it. Five is the reimbursement. Yeah. Then, okay. I, I thought you said page six, Mary. I'm sorry. It is. Read read the top okay, of so page six. Agencies shall include yep. on the budget request for each of the fiscal agencies. Shall include. So it will be part of the budget request. So we're not committed to it. So it's part of the budget request for 21 and 23 for that same amount each year. Correct. So this is asking for the $9,000 for fiscal year 21. And for mm -hmm. it to continue, the agency is going to have to request it. It does not guarantee it a path forward. Yes. That's um, exactly. Appropriation, though, is for. Um, non-members of the legislature. So we would not use the legislature's budget for this. We would use regular gen general fund. And I don't know the breakdown between the members. Um, do we have a breakdown between the members on the, the group? Do I have that listed? I, My I don't believe that is listed anywhere. Okay. Jim, do you happen to know that from Jim from Ledge Council? Yeah, so there are no members of the legislature on this advisory group. There are six members who are uh, people who otherwise would not be compensated, or likely would not be. So the way that's computed is six members uh, times 125 or so uh, times 12 meetings, uh, which is JFO's guidance as to how to compute that. So there are. Um, 14 members of the advisory uh, group, and six of whom are uh, receiving compensation or could, could be. Okay, so uh, so currently when we pass this back um, for the, the original group, the funding for that group came out of the general fund or out of the AOE? It came out of the, um, let me just go back to the original bill. Uh, appropriation is from the general fund. Exactly as it is now, the appropriation for initially was for fiscal year 18. Yes. Came from the general fund, and then the agency was asked to include in its budget for future years the same amount. Okay, now that's jogging a memory. We, we agreed to do it for one year, and then, we, right. and then we asked the agency to find it within the education fund. Is that correct? No. No. It's not correct? Can you move that page up, Maria, please, to page five for me so I can read that language? Kitty, remember that AOE is funded out of general funds, not out of the education fund. Right. Right, but were we moving, were we going, was the understanding that we would fund it for one year and then move it to the education fund? No, that we would ask the agency to put it in their budget, which we would fund. We, okay, just to put it in their budget. Okay. Right. And Probably so, not an allowable expense from the education fund either. Right. Would have to be a general right, fund expense. Right. So it would have to be a general fund. Okay, so we know it is a general fund expense. It wouldn't come out of the legislature's budget. They're requesting uh, that there's more meetings, which will cost more money. And they're asking for the $9,000 now. And then to go forward, we're going back to the original plan where it would then be a request within the AOE's budget. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So the, the question before us now is, it, it, it's not part of the AOE's budget like we had hoped. And they need an increase of time. And does the committee want to uh, appropriate these dollars? That's that's the question before us now. And this is for the FY21 budget, not, we would probably put this in the skinny budget, not for the BAA. Right. Um, is, there, um, is there a reason this needs to be expedited, Larry? Uh, <clears throat> I, I don't think there's a reason to expedite it other than, um, you know, we're looking at, we're looking at these times, these dates um, and school budgets. Of course, you know, there are 19 school budgets out there that are 
<clears throat> have not been voted on or have been turned down by by the by the voters um, in getting you know getting ready for the FY 21-22 school year may be <laughs> interrupted again. We're not sure. Nobody is sure what's really going to happen. Um, but it it would be it would be in my opinion. Um, good to have this move along as quickly as possible, I guess. Um, My question is- and particularly, excuse, particularly getting the advisory board online with, with the census funding. Um, okay. And that would be my opinion. Uh, Marty? I guess I'm having trouble understanding why this is a COVID-19 emergency. I, I guess you're just saying people can't get together and work on this and or making the arrangements for school budgets because things are in turmoil right now. I don't really understand why it is, it's being described as a COVID-19 emergency. And I certainly don't see that those expenses could be legitimately charged to the CRF fund at some point. But maybe others have different ideas. Well, the, the you know, here again, um, Marty, our, 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 our schools are closed um, and they're closed because of the COVID issue. And this bill um, basically Again, we're, you know, we're talking about independent schools as well um, and student participation and IEPs um, and how they're going to be funded. And, you know, it's, uh, and it's a lot of work, I might add, um, that, that has gone into this. Um, and, you know, our committee went over this bill um, a number of times and found that it, it's very necessary to happen. Um, we, we do need to continue to support special education for our students um, at a time, hopefully soon. Um, but I think the sooner that we, the sooner we start really putting these, the census grant together um, and making it work effectively for the kids, our students, the better off we're all going to be. And, um, and, and it is, uh, uh, I think in the long run, based on a census rather than a block grant, I think will in fact save education dollars. Um, so I agree with all that. Just my concern is why can't some of this work go on in the meantime? But that's up for the education department to decide. Um, so what I am going to suggest is because gone over our time and we need to be on the House floor. Um, Larry, we are going to uh, revisit this maybe this afternoon or on Monday. And um, I, the committee has a couple, I mean, I, there's a couple more questions that need to come back to you. Okay. Uh, we'll either do them through email or, or maybe have you back in uh, on Monday to complete but um, I do need to move to Steve Klein and our last piece on the agenda. And I'm really sorry we're crunched for time. Because Not a problem. On the floor. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Um, if members would uh, send questions to Chip uh, so that Larry can have them in advance so that we can um, uh, move, move along fast on Monday, that would be great. Um, we're, we're going to, it's like the end of year, move from one thing to the next very, very quickly. Um, Steve has received two uh, pieces of guidance re um, uh, regarding Corona dollars and I wanted him to review that with the committee. Steve. Yeah, and I, given the timing, which I realize is like three minutes, I won't right. review, I'll tell you about it and then we'll, we'll find another time to do it. There's two things that happened this week. One is that the, um, the treasury offered to frequently ask questions, expansion of that which created a, a lot more clarity. And um, that is uh, not great clarity. And at some point we go over it, <laughs> we're, um, it definitely uh, put a uh, it, it, real clear that we couldn't even use the money for property tax relief that we were planning on doing in the House Ways and Means proposal that I think have been discussed with this committee. So that sort of went away for a while. 
and then on a couple of days ago, the administration issued a CRF guidance, which is a mixture of, it's built on the federal guidance, but it also takes it a little further in different areas, creates, it, it creates sort of absolute in categories that I'm not sure are absolute. So it, it, it complicates it. So it, we, the administration guidance is only, what's interesting about them is they're both a guidance, nobody's doing any rules. And so um, guidance doesn't go through the legislative joint rules process. Um, the federal guidance doesn't go through the administrative rules process. So it's all subject to change. Um, I don't really know that it probably, and you tell me, I thought you would need to leave at 10. So I'll just sort of say, at some point yeah. we can talk more about this. I'll be writing about it in my, uh, the weekly update, I think. Yes, and I, there's going to be many questions on this. Uh, so let me just, uh, Steve, guys, this was really more than a 10 minute, um, yeah. a 10 minute discussion and, and, and it's going to open up a, a lot of questions. I need to know from the committee, we had um, not set um, in my book, we did not set a time to meet Friday afternoon, but we did say possibly uh, in, in discussion, I wrote down possibly a half hour or something after the floor if needed. Uh, there's a couple of things that is we need to get this adjustment out. I'd like to make a decision on clean water today. I'd like to make a decision on the administration's language today. Monday, we'll decide on the end of year construct. Um, I'd like to tell you a conversation I had with the treasurer and we need to sort out um, any issues with this Ed bill so that we can vote on it on Monday or make a decision on its, its fate on Monday. Is there anyone who is not available? I'm sorry, it's Friday afternoon, but as we're getting paid to work, uh, is there anyone who's not available this afternoon? Um, I'm not sure you're not, Peter. I am not available. You're not available. Um, what, what time are you available today? I mean, if you want to go, you know, after floor, that's fine. Um, I have a hard stop time just a wee bit after one o'clock. I'm really stretching it by saying a wee bit after one o'clock. Um, do we want to come back at, at, I don't know when the floor is gonna get done. So I, you know, I, we have three bills on the floor right now. Um, let's do, um, let's do a check-in. Um, how can we make this work? Peter, we may have to continue without you. Um, That's fine. That's fine. You wanna just text me when you think you're gonna be close or something? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I just have no idea the floor, even after the three bills are out, if Mitzi has anything else planned. Let's uh, let's check in um, a half hour after the floor. Is that good with everybody? That's fine. Yep, sounds good. Okay. And Teresa, you'll yeah. be following the floor, so you will send us a link that we'll find at the top of our emails. Sure, yep. Okay. okay. I, can, I can send the link now and just adjust the time. Okay. Once I know. So you'll okay. So ready. a half hour after the oh. floor, and I know it's Friday, and I'm sorry, but we have got to move this stuff along. Sure, it's okay. Okay, Kitty, yes, Kitty, yes. Kitty, hang on. You have a meeting at noon, so. Oh yeah, I do. Yes, I have a meeting at noon. So um, half hour after the floor, if it's after uh, one o'clock. If it's before that, let's let's meet at one o'clock. And you also have a meeting at two, I think. I'm not sure the um, leadership meeting. Yeah, I know. There's a two. Oh, jeez. Um, I, I can I miss the two, the two o'clock meeting. I can miss. Um, so <laughs> let's 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 check in at one o'clock, and if the floor goes on until three, we'll meet a half hour after the floor. Okay. If floor is after, so let's plan for one o'clock. Okay, so I need to stop the live stream. So pause. Yeah. yeah.